my name is Bill Klein. I am one of the co-chairs of the Ford Task Force. And on behalf of the Task Force in the City of St. Paul, I'd like to welcome you to our meeting tonight. Uh, this is the last in a series of topical meetings that went back to January of this year. Uh, we've had six of them. The subjects of those meetings are spelled out on the back. Uh, and the purpose of these meetings is basically so that we can share information with you. The city can tell you what current thinking is, what options may be on these various topics, to provide some background on these things, to identify choices and trade-offs that we have to be considered as we look forward to the zoning process and the public realm plan that will be the ultimate goal of, of this process to seek your input on priorities and questions that we're facing as we look at those things. To use your input to refine priorities that will be discussed by the task force and by the city as they look at the zoning possibilities. And, and then ultimately to help us design that zoning and public realm plan. Um, we are looking forward to having some additional meetings come the fall on those broader areas and this input will be used for that purpose. But I would also invite you to look at the website relating to this. Input isn't confined to these meetings and there are avenues for input on the website, which has been recently redesigned and if you haven't looked at it recently, I'd encourage you to do so. And with that, I'd like to introduce the mayor of our fair city of St. Paul, Chris Coleman. If you remember, he sort of keyed up teed off this series back in November when we met at St. Kate's. And it's all very fitting that he come back at this meeting to you know, tell you what the thoughts are at this point. Mayor? Well, thank you so much for being here. Uh, we have had a series of great conversations uh, on a lot of different topics from energy use to open space to, uh, to transportation and bike planning and, and all of the things. Uh, and it really makes sense because when you think about the site, uh, there is a comprehensiveness to the work that we're doing to make sure that we maximize the opportunity on the Ford site. We've talked about this before. We really have talked about it since uh, uh, you know we, we were first informed that the Ford site was uh, or the Ford plant itself was going to uh, to close, and we've had an opportunity to look at what other cities are doing, what other communities and, and other development sites uh, how they are going about the work that they're doing. Uh, I think since the last time I was at one of the meetings, I think you've had a meeting since then, uh, but uh, a, a delegation went over and studied sites over in Europe. We studied sites in Berlin, in Copenhagen, in two cities in Sweden, really getting a sense of how do you do something in a, in, in a, in a, on a site like this that is maybe not you know, exactly the way that we have done development in the city of St. Paul. What's the latest and greatest in green technology? What is the latest in housing strategies? What is the latest of integration in, in, uh, in transportation and bike infrastructure uh, and green space and all of those things? Um, and how do, we, how do we really try to maximize uh, these hundred and you know, almost 30 acres uh, that we have before us? And of course, one of the key components of that is absolutely job creation. Uh, Ann Hunt uh, is, is uh, fond of saying, you know, we can't just create places where uh, people sell lottery tickets to each other in coffee shops. Uh, we actually have to create jobs uh, when we think about redevelopment opportunities, working with our partners like the, with the Port Authority and others uh, to figure out what are, the, what are the 21st century jobs that we can be creating on the site. How do we attract talent to this community? Uh, are there partnerships that we can, we can bring in uh, through the University of Minnesota or other universities or colleges uh, that might have an opportunity to, to do some uh, research centers or, or some things that, you know, examples that we've seen around the country uh, in other, other places? Uh, and, and the more that we have clearly identified uh, job creation as an integral part of the work that we're doing, the more likely it is, uh, you know, if you name it, it, ha it can happen. Uh, if you don't name it or if you kind of say it's a subtopic somewhere, uh, then it tends not to happen. Uh, and so with this opportunity, it's kind of funny, when we were over in Europe, we saw these sites uh, you know, we think of this 130 acres and all my, you know, boy, this is a huge site. What an amazing opportunity. Well, we were looking at sites over in Europe that were, you know, 6,000 acres. And so in some ways this felt, this feels kind of small uh, when you've seen it. But the thing that I was impressed by uh, in some of the things that we saw over in Europe uh, is, is there are new ways of, of thinking things, uh, number one, or thinking about things that we can incorporate into the site. 
Two, I think we're in some ways farther along than a lot of other places that we saw in Europe. Uh, for instance, the airport site in, in Berlin, uh, that you know, the, uh, the airport is still open, it hasn't closed, but they've been doing a lot of planning uh, related to that. Um, and one of the things that we asked about was, was the integration of transportation. Berlin has a fairly advanced uh, uh, transportation network, uh, and yet there had been only in recently had people started to ask the questions about integrating transportation into the 6,000 acre site, uh, which we thought was kind of odd that that had been kind of almost an afterthought of the conversation. Uh, we saw some sites that had uh, you know, larger buildings, but really spread out, uh, so there, was very, there wasn't much density there. Uh, they had some interesting green technologies, uh, but they weren't necessarily what I thought maximizing opportunities on that site in almost doing suburban style developments uh, and some of the places that we saw. Uh, and then some of the sites that the group toured in Malmo and Stockholm, uh, I think probably were the most advanced in terms of integrating all of these uses, housing, uh, different housing types, different kind of layouts of, of neighborhoods, but also integrating it very clearly with green and open space, uh, the latest and greatest in, in, in environmental sustainability practices, uh, but also having jobs uh, as, as, as a clear part of that focus. And again, even there, we saw where there was an integrate, where there was kind of a disconnect in, in some ways in some sites uh, between, between uh, uh, the job creation piece of it uh, and the housing strategy. Uh, we, we, I've told this story before because I had seen one of these sites in Malmo many, many years ago. Uh, and there's, a, there's this great housing development, it has the absolute latest and greatest in green technology. And then there was a wind turbine manufacturer, a factoring facility, uh, about you know, two, or, two or three blocks away from this housing. I said, well, that's great. Uh, you have this green manufacturing, green, you know, green jobs there. And they said, oh, we're going to get rid of those. And I said, well, why, why are you getting rid of those? And they said, well, there's really no place for jobs. You know, we, we don't want that kind of you know, industrial uses here. Um, and I just thought it was an interesting kind of disconnect between what they were trying to do on one hand uh, with trying to create a community that people could live, work, uh, and recreate in, uh, but also do it in kind of uh, with, with the latest and greatest in terms of green strategies. So I think these conversations that we're having uh, continually reinforce for me that what we can do on the Ford site, uh, the opportunity that we can seize here, really can be a showcase for people across the country and across the globe. Uh, to, to really figure out how do you integrate strategies uh, be, be with jobs, housing, and all the other components of it. Uh, and I think that this is a critical piece. Just one, you know, when you think about the transportation piece, and, and a lot of us are concerned, you know, what, is, what are the impacts of, of a large-scale development on the Ford site to the corner of Cleveland and Ford Parkway? Well, the best way that we could possibly reduce traffic on Cleveland and Ford Parkway or, or, or uh, take, take some of that traffic that would otherwise be coming from that site is to have people be able to walk to their job, uh, be able to walk to the store, be able to walk to a place where they would go out for dinner uh, and, and reduce significantly the need for an automobile uh, and having to, try, having to uh, try to get through the corner of Cleveland and Ford Parkway. That's why this job creation strategy becomes so important. If we're gonna maximize the opportunity there, in a way that integrates with the existing you know, great neighborhoods around it. Uh, it does it in a way that, that seizes the opportunity, but, but actually lifts up uh, the surrounding neighborhood as opposed to detracting from it, then we really have to take this comprehensive approach. And so I'm just very thankful and, and always grateful to uh, Council Member Tobert's uh, great work and leadership on this. Uh, our Planning and Economic Development Department continues to uh, have these great conversations, uh, and all of our partners that are at the table to really think through some of these strategies. So so, uh, beautiful night. Um, I'll be around for a little bit, but then I'm going to go try to enjoy just a wee bit of the evening. Uh, but uh, really looking forward to the, to the conversation. Uh, obviously, as you know, the timeline continues to uh, move forward. Uh, Ford gets closer and closer as we get a little bit more clarity around the uh, environmental conditions. Uh, we continue to hope that we will have that report uh, in the work, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the real layout of the, of the soil conditions, et cetera, from the state very soon uh, that will really allow us to then move to the next phases that we've been talking about for so many years and are so anxious to see. So thank you so much for, for being here. Thank you for caring about this site. Uh, and thank you for uh, just continuing to participate in the conversation. Have a great night. Thank you very much, Mayor Coleman. Uh, those were great remarks, and they hit on the key principles that we're going to be sharing with you tonight and talking about related to our topics of the evening, jobs and housing. 
So these principles, we have them in a number of different categories, and they sort of underlie the work that we're doing and that we're refining this evening. So for jobs and tax base, our principles are a significant increase in the tax base over time that strengthens surrounding property values, increased regional significance and economic value that the site creates, and a range of business and employment opportunities with an emphasis on family sustaining jobs. In housing, we have one principle. It's broad, but it hits, hits what we're trying to do. And that is to provide a range of housing types and affordability that expand choices in the area and in the city. So tonight, you'll be hearing more about how we go about accomplishing those principles. And the first part of our presentation will focus on jobs. And for that, I would like to introduce Ellen Muller. Well, I'm here tonight because Merritt told me I had to be. <laughs> and I'm glad to be here. So I'm Ellen Muller, and I uh, want to just give you a little bit of um, background. I have been with the city for about seven years, and my focus is really on business development. I work with startup companies, small to mid-sized companies, and our larger fi Fortune 500 companies, and we make sure that those businesses have the tools that they need to grow and expand and to locate in the city of St. Paul. So we have a lot of fun doing that. And we do that in a variety of ranges. But that's why I was asked to help um, lead the, the work of the, uh, the Jobs Task Force. So I wanted to just tell you a little bit about the Jobs uh, Task Force so that you can um, understand that we had a really great group of people who devoted a lot of time to helping us over the last 10 months wrestle around with what types of jobs are best suited and how can we recommend and inform the zoning committee um, to the best of our ability. So the, the goal um, of our group was to collectively collaborate with our partners to identify best jobs and industry types to target for recruitment for the site. And we needed to do that based on the site amenities and its constraints and in consideration of what emerging industries and employers are out there, not only today, but those of the future. So I wanted to just mention who was um, part of our partnering group. Um, and if you're here, please just wave your hand and, and so folks know that you're here. Uh, Louis Jamboy, the president of the Port Authority. Matt Kramer from the St. Paul Area Chamber. Uh, Harry Melander from the Building Trades Carrie Tierney from the Highland Business Association. From DEED, we had Kevin McKinnon, Deputy Commissioner of Economic Development, and John Schaffner, Director of Business Development. And your humble servants at the city would be Matt Freeman from the Mayor's Office, Libby Kantner from uh, Councilmember Tolbert's Office, Jonathan Sage Martinson, our Director of Planning and Economic Development, Merritt Clapp Smith, our Principal Planner for the site, and myself. So I just want to thank the, that group for spending every month on every Friday um, wrestling around with these important questions. One of the things that we determined in a lot of the conversation is where do we really have influence? Because I think um, what we know is, is that we all want to be in charge, um, but we know that that is not necessarily the case. And we know that the landowner really um, is the one who will decide who they will sell the site to. Um, the market, of course, will determine um, what it's worth, and uh, the market will determine if the site has the type of characteristics that it needs in order to um, entice a buyer. The city, of course, will have influence over zoning, which will determine all kinds of uses. It will determine what the buildings look like, how big they are, what they look like. Um, and then the city and the state will, dis you know, will set the rules around, you know, how much noise will be allowed, how smelly it can't be, um, and just talk about just all the other tools that typically are involved in site selection processes. So when it comes time to marketing and recruiting these type of businesses, the landowner clearly will be involved in that. But our partnerships will really be instrumental in our work with um, not only our internal offices, but the chamber, the port, the deed, and greater MSP. In fact, um, I think I f uh, failed to mention Cecile Bador and David Griggs from greater MSP were also a part of our task force. Of course, the landowner, the Ford land, will determine the final sale to the master developer. 
and then we'll decide with the state what the appropriate allowed uses and standards are. And then we never want to leave the, lead the conversation with um, financial tools or incentives, but the fact remains that there are some states that have you know, rather robust um, a toolbox for bringing large, uh, glamorous employers to a particular site. We would have a choice on how that would work. And um, of course, that would require some money, which we don't happen to have in the bank. So um, time will tell about that. So I want to talk to you a little bit about it. We did an analysis, and we said, OK, what's so great about the site? And many of you know what's great about the site. Um, there are, you know, the location, 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 location. It's proximity to the airport, the great access to the river, the Minnehaha Park, and the Grand Rounds, the rail corridor, the transit corridor, all the infrastructure that's already there. Um, let's see if I can use this. Let's see. Oops. There, the, uh, the wastewater treatment plant, the power source. This underground area, um, I don't know if many of you are familiar, but there is a series of tunnels. We call them the caves at PED. But there is an opportunity to, to take a look at whether or not there's a specialized use that could be used for that area underground. And then, of course, just being in a great neighborhood and a very vibrant um, business community and a, a great neighborhood. But one of the things that I th I think was the most impactful for the task force was we looked at who lives and works within a 22 minute commute of the Ford site. And we looked at that, it's a seven mile radius. And the reason we looked at that is not many people want to spend more than that amount of time in their car when they go to a job. And what we learned is that the group of people that live and work in this seven mile commuter shed are very representative of the people who live and work uh, at all kinds of companies um, in the entire metro area. We have 56% of those workers in this uh, seven mile commuter shed have uh, some college or bachelor's or advanced degree or an associate degree. So over half are educated at some level to some skill level all the way up to a PhD and beyond. 58% are 30 to 54 year olds, and 50% of these folks make uh, over $3,300 a month. So I think that's very interesting. Then we had to look at the constraints of the site. And I'm sure you're familiar with the constraints. Um, you know, in and out access is tricky, traffic is tricky. Um, it's not cheap to live and work and buy land in this area compared to other areas around the metro. Um, site selectors would say we're not quite shovel ready yet. Uh, we will be, I mean, after all the um, deconstruction is finished and we know what the environmental impacts are. But it will be a phased development. It'll, it'll take a while to fully realize the dream, whatever the final vision and dream becomes. Um, there are some jobs that are well suited for the site based on the work that our group did. Um, a lot of you know, high tech R&D um, would be more, maybe more suitable than maybe heavy traditional um, uh, manufacturing. And because we're surrounded by a beautiful, a vibrant neighborhood, we have to balance um, the type of jobs that are compatible with the, uh, the immediate surroundings. Now, we had to look at a scenario of how many jobs per square foot do we think can happen um, at this site. And the Port Authority has come up with a formula um, that they have used with their business planning through their business parks. And they estimate about three jobs per square feet for office uh, um, and about one job per square thousand foot for um, industry. And the Green Building Council has said that neighborhood retail would generate about two jobs per thousand square feet. And so we, we use that as a basis to, to think about how many people could we potentially put um, on a portion of the site. We are also planning um, a modeling, a trip modeling study that will be used to examine the potential trip generations by different uses on the site. So that will be coming. That will definitely inform um, the work that we're doing and also inform the zoning group as well. 
Um, there were, if you'll recall back in 2007, there were five scenarios that were generated by that green, um, the green use for job study. And there, the, the primary um, was a primary reuse for industry. One was mixed use, light industrial, flex. The third scenario was mixed use office within an institutional campus. The fourth was an urban village and the fifth was a high density. And so we looked at all that, and what we determined um, is that the most likely um, would be the, um, the office and mixed use, because um, that would generate the, the best potential of jobs. And I'll, I'll be going over that in a minute with you. We also talked about what is a good job? I mean, you know, your, your high schooler has one definition, and you probably have another de uh, definition. So we determined that a good job is a, a job that can, is a family sustaining job. Now when you look at these family sustaining wages, this is based on um, the Department of Health and Human Services at a federal level. And it says that you know, at a starting, at a very minimum, you would start at 15.15 an hour. Now that's without benefits. But we think a good job should include benefits. And um, so that then would be if a company offered 12.83 an hour with benefits, that would be good. An even better job is if that job had benefits beyond that that they are willing to pay for. Another definition is there's a place to go. You have a place for advancement. And um, so we want to know from you tonight, you know, what do you think is a good job? Um, we've heard that in addition to these things, folks are thinking about um, professional jobs, high tech, R&D, med device, um, you know, c companies, I was at a, an event right before this meeting at the University Enterprise Laboratory. There are a lot of startup lab based businesses in that very beautiful building. Um, so thinking about those kinds of jobs. Um, some clean, high precision, custom manufacturing, prototyping, people who make, people who make things, people who make um, you know, garments, people who make uh, 3D precision tools. Just those kinds of, thinking about those kinds of jobs. And we know that there's a series of jobs that will show up just because we're going to have a beautiful development. And that will be the retail and services arena. And we, we want you to know we're going to be talking about that this evening. And we know that they will be there and we will ask for your input. But the work of this task force, the jobs task force, was really to focus on all the other jobs. So I just want you to, to know that that's where we spent most of our time. But with that, we know you care about retail and services. And what we know is that great development attracts um, people. It attracts people because there's a synergy. If it's done well, there's an interface of wonderful, beautiful things to look at, interesting architecture, green spaces, places to sit down, places to walk, places to ride your bike. Um, and we know that most retail and services don't play, pay a sustaining, family sustaining wage. Some do, um, but most don't. So, um, and what we know is that in our zoning work, we cannot dictate brand. We can only dictate size, form, and design, you know, floor area ratio, all this technical stuff. So we can't determine, for instance, you know, between what kind of coffee we like or what kind of um, sundries we like to buy or what kind of groceries we like to buy. So just keep that in mind as we ask for your feedback. And we also know that when you build new stuff and you develop these great new developments, um, the cost per square foot is more expensive than perhaps a, an, an older um, development or an older place. And so we know that that will present a challenge. That's why I think a lot of national retailers um, are interested in that new swanky new space. And we know that for smaller businesses, if they're not, if they don't have a good relationship with their bank and they don't have, you know, built-in lines of credits or um, established bankable relationships, as, as the bankers say, they, they find it challenging to, to maybe compete because of the cost of being there. So we will be asking you questions about, you know, what, what do you think needs to be here? What's missing from the neighborhood? What should it look like? What kind of form should it take? And then 
we're going to be talking about office, industrial, and institutional. The Port Authority did a very extensive study in 2012. They contracted with um, a group called ICIC, the Intercompetitive, Louis, where are you? ICIC. The Initiative for Competitive Inner Cities. There we go. And what, what they helped the Port Authority do is really make the case that we need to make sure we're preserving places where people can work. Um, and that, uh, you know, because not everybody is a CPA, not everybody's an attorney, and not everybody's a biophysicist. So we want to make sure that we have this uh, continuum of opportunities for people to work that have, you know, some skilled training and then have an opportunity for advancement. A third of our land in St. Paul, we're a capital city, uh, we're the county seat, so we have the privilege of housing all of that, and we've got about a third of our land is um, for is an, on non-taxable, it's tax exempt, and we've got some great places. You know, Como Zoo is an example, the Capitol is an example, um, the Science Museum is an example. So um, they're iconic, tax exempt places in the city that we love. Um, but we, what we also learned in that study was that industrial users and their tax base, they generate more on behalf of our residential population. They pay more for the right-of-way fees and they pay a, double our property taxes. So we know that this type of um, category is important to our economy. The other thing that we know is that um, these are examples of a couple of buildings up here, but what we have to be paying attention to is what, what will work. Um, you know, is, is a supercomputer company going to have a problem with vibrations in the area, which will affect other types of uses? Uh, will turning radiuses prevent some businesses or building forms to prevent from being part of, you know, a certain part of the site. Um, we just have to get a sense of the visual context of what should the building look like, how should they function, because we do have, we do have control over that. These are just some examples of various buildings that um, have either office or industry. I, it, I, I thought, you know, as I was coming over, we should have had a picture of the University Enterprise Laboratory. If you haven't seen that building, it would be a good example for you to look at. And so then we have to look at what's the right mix of jobs at the site. There were 1,800 people that used to work at this site, and um, we know that it's not likely that we're going to have 1,800 people on this site working, but there can be a combination of um, of those positions. And we know also that um, with the exception of independent, assisted, and uh, skilled living, um, if we only develop housing and retail, we won't be able to create the family sustaining jobs that, that, uh, that we desire here. So we'll be asking the questions about what's the right balance and how important is land for the higher paid jobs versus the housing, retail, and other uses. So you guys are going to be busy today. The only, the, I just want to end with some current trends that I think are really important. Um, the young workforce is changing in the way they like to work. Um, and what we, what we are seeing is that by 2020, 40% of our workforce will be contracted, temps, or self-employed. That's a pretty interesting trend. This comes from the Labor Statistics Bureau. Um, job mobility, you remember the days when our um, parents and maybe some of us stayed with companies for many, many, many years? That is not the case anymore. And in fact, um, for all workers, our average is at about 4.4 years. For millennials, it's about two and a half years. So that's pretty amazing. Um, people like to telecommute, they want flexibility, they want to share office space. And you know, Forbes was quoted by saying, the people who create, build, design, tinker, modify, hack, invent, or simply make something, they are moving our economy. So I think we need to take that into consideration as we talk about the jobs. So then we'll t we're, what, what the jobs task force is asking you about is, do you, do you think that we're on the right track with these types of jobs? Um, and do you think there are other types of jobs that we should be thinking about? 
And what are, you know, how much influence should we let, like, the future job trends? We have a whole list of jobs that are going to be popular or de in demand in the next uh, 15 to 20 years. Um, should we be building to suit that, or do we dictate um, some other way? Do we, and we do, how do we do that? So we're looking forward to your feedback this evening. Um, I want to take this time to introduce Jen Jordan, who's going to spend, um, a great 10, 15 minutes talking about housing. Thanks so much. Good evening, my name is Jennifer Jordan. I'm a housing project manager with St. Paul Planning and Economic Development. Thank you so much for having me tonight. Um, I'm delighted to be here and delighted to give you a, a quick presentation on sort of where housing is in terms of the, um, the current uh, realities here in Highland Park and what the trends are. Oops, there we go. So Highland Park, it's a lovely neighborhood. Uh, it's single family primarily. And the image to the right shows a bunch of yellow. It's not important that you see the detail of it, but it tells a very important story. Highland Park is a single family neighborhood, and that's reflected with the yellow color on the map. The multifamily options are reflected in red. And so as a result, you know, Highland Park is an outstanding single family neighborhood, attracts a lot of families but it doesn't always offer the full range of housing choices that we're starting to see in the market. And as a result, there's a desire to move towards more different types of housing um, types and styles across the metro. This slide kind of gives you, a, it's a very dry slide, but it gives you an understanding of the policy framework that the city of St. Paul is working under in terms of our comprehensive plan. Our comprehensive plan is, is guiding future development for the long term. And in terms of that, providing affordable housing is very important um, goal of the comprehensive plan. In and, in and of itself, um, increasing housing choices across a wide range of, of neighborhoods and economies is important. Developing land efficiently. We are a built out city and so we don't really have many opportunities like this at the Ford site. Um, to do new development in such a large scale. Finally, promoting cultural sensitivity in, in how we develop housing is important. And then affirmatively furthering fair housing. We want to make sure that the housing that we, uh, when we work with developers, that we're helping to give a wide range of, of housing types and housing affordabilities for everybody. The city of St. Paul has a locational choice policy specifically that says we will strive to um, provide affordable housing and a range of housing options in all neighborhoods across the city of St. Paul. So some housing trends. Um, as you know, Highland Park's a single family neighborhood, but there is a rising increase of one person households, both in Highland Park and in the city of St. Paul. This is going to continue to rise um, as the baby boomers continue to age. We're going to see a 65% increase in single um, person households until 2030. And as a result of us being a built out city, development of, of new housing units is probably going to require that they be attached. And that 2040, um, that uh, reference is made by the Metropolitan Council saying that any types of new development that is, is going to be focusing on a single person household is, is probably going to be an attached type of unit. So like a town home or a, a multifamily complex or what have you. And then finally, in conjunction with all of this, we've got a rising um, level of cost burden. And so what that means is, you know, we're not making as much wages, our wages aren't increasing as much as costs are, and more and more households across both Highland Park and the city of St. Paul are cost burdened in paying more than 30% of their income towards housing. And that's going to increase over time. So housing variety at the Ford site, it's a tremendous opportunity. Um, it can offer a lot of different diversity in, in terms of housing types and styles. Um, and different needs that people might need. But, you know, keeping in check that, you know, the site 
housed an industrial use for a long time. So environmental site constraints are going to be an issue in terms of whether housing can happen here or where it can happen. And so from a housing perspective, we're most interested in this question for you tonight is what types of housing are most needed to expand options in the Highland Park neighborhood and in the city, but, but mainly here in Highland Park. And also, the development and the style of housing is important. Design and form matter. Um, how it's going to look, how it's going to interact with the street, and how people are going to interact amongst one another in, de in the development is going to be important. So our questions to you tonight are, what styles and design features are interesting or attractive for residential buildings to you? What is your preference in terms of building forms in low, medium, and high density residential housing development? And why? <coughs> so this slide kind of speaks to the fact that there is an added bonus with density. You can get amenities both within a development as well as within a neighborhood with increased density. Market rate multifamily developments can provide residents increased amenities with, within the building and in terms of the public realm. Higher densities provide the population to attract market-driven amenities and services and people, like millennials. So our key question to you tonight is, should the, the Ford site use increased housing density to create and attract more <coughs> amenities and services? I touched on a little bit earlier about the, the need for increasing affordability. As the aging baby boomer generation um, continues to transition out of their single family homes, they're demanding different types of housing types. And you know, generally, in terms of retirement, your income is either stable or, or slightly lower than what you're making when you're working. So there's going to continue to be a need for increased housing affordability over time. In addition to that, younger generations, both millennials and Gen Xers, are looking for different ranges of affordability depending on what's going on in their lives. And as I'd said before, our wages aren't keeping pace with the cost of living. So this slide kind of gets it from left to right, the image of, you know, what can we do or you know, what is preferred in terms of affordability for the housing that could be developed on this site? And it ranges from on the left side doing, doing nothing and just letting the market take over and providing whatever product it's going to provide to providing public subsidy which could require some level of affordability, some demands upon a developer, to possibly providing density bonuses, which would give a, a greater kind of level or um, lens of affordability to any development, and then moving forward with you know, a, a combination of those two. So I think you all know that this site is very, very attractive. It's beautiful in terms of its, its views of the river. And so the market will, if housing can be developed here, will be, I think, quick to respond. And so the question that we pose to you tonight is, how should the city of St. Paul um, encourage affordable housing options at the site? Should we let the market just take it and see where it goes? Or, or should we, we try to like really get a wider range of housing affordabilities? And so with that, I will turn it over to Merritt. So that wraps up our presentations. We now ask you for the next 45 minutes or so to go amongst the tables. We have two sets of tables that have identical content. You can go to the set of tables in here or the set of tables out there and read, provide comments, um, give us your input, and then you can go out and enjoy the evening. And we do look, we really appreciate all the input that we'll receive tonight. We've received at previous meetings, and we are posting it on the website, and we'll be summarizing it in the coming month. And stay connected to us. I'll leave this slide up through website, Facebook, whatever you'd like. So thank you very much, and looking forward to hearing from you.
Thank you.